misled you? Are you here because somebody sent you a note? Are you here because it's just been a long time? We are really interested in what brought you here today because I will be honest with you to say we have usually sat here with one guest and it is amazing. I mean, like I'm overwhelmed. Okay, Jeremiah 31 is the theme for Tony Sessiman's uh, chosen weekend. And I'd like to read that to you. The people at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword, I will find favor in the meadows, no, in the <coughs> desert. Sometimes our places are at the end of a sword and in a desert, but God is with us. Amen. The Lord appeared to us in the past over and over and over again so that we might be able to say with confidence, I, God, have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again. And you will be rebuilt. Amen. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Right. Amen. We may bring Christ to them in the prison, but it may still be their desert. Mm -hmm. But we will reassure them that the everlasting love that is offered by an unconditional loving God <coughs> is there for them as well as for us. Amen. So as we pray for our team in there today, for Tony, and at this very time, they may very well be leading up to writing all their forgiveness things on dissolvable rice paper and imagining what that was like and how it felt. I don't know how it happened for other weekends, but that's where we're at. They're Saturday afternoon. They're all tired. But they know they're right on the edge of breakthrough for so many. Maybe it'll happen tonight after we hand them all of those bags. We got great big bags now because Kathy Ridge ordered bags that are like this big that we can stuff Kathy in. When they walk out quiet and silent, wrestling with God and saying, wow, what am I going to do with everything that's been dumped other than um, gain 10 pounds? <laughs> <laughs> so I am very, very thankful, Fred Poole, that you are here to tell us, because we've never had the opportunity to hear that grace, mm -hmm. and then come and tell others. So I don't know how else to give you another introduction but to tell your own, tell your story, and thank you for being here to touch, your, touch us with your story mm -hmm. as God touched you. Welcome. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for the welcome. I want to thank you for the invitation. I want to thank you and tell you that I'm so happy and I'm so proud to be here with you. Let me, let me, let me start off by giving you a little introduction about myself and then I'll get into how great you are. Because it's all about you and what God continues to do through you, which you gave to me. And I openly accepted it. And I was a hardhead. I was a knucklehead. So I was a tough tough egg. I was hard to crack. I was one of those kind of people that you had to show me. You know, they say it's best to live through experience. If anybody in the room has not been kicked in the butt, I'm going to give you first advice. Don't get kicked in the butt to know that it hurts. <laughs> first of all, I did 27 years. I started off in the county jail. I did about 18 months and from there I went to Wendy. I did about a year and a half. From there I went to Attica, from Attica I went to Auburn, from Auburn I went to Cayuga, from Cayuga I went to Collins, which I spent 13 years, and from Collins I was shipped all the way down in the Hudson area, I did time at Fishkill, and then they turned around 
after six parole boards and they punished me and they dropped me off six months before my release at Gawanda. I got an opportunity to thank your husband, Deacon Ramos. Very, very kind person. I, I had the opportunity to sit on the fifth floor after right hip replacement, which took me about 20 minutes each and every day to get back up five floors of steps. And I had the opportunity to look out the window and see the cube at Collins that I lived in for seven years. I watched it every day. And I was missing certain things like family reunion visits. That's where the family can come and spend a couple of days with you because Wanda doesn't have that. Collins does. I was separated by 30 feet of being with my wife, of being with my children, of being with my grandchildren, of being with my mother and father. Now let me tell you about what really happened. See, what happened was that they dropped me off at Collins in 1996 as a lost, kind of hardened prisoner. I never considered myself a criminal because I was one of the few people that had no past criminal history. They say that most of us, by the time that we end up in the penitentiary, have had ten brushes or more with the law. That means we've trespassed, that means we've broken into houses, that means that we've stolen stuff from grocery stores and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was a suburban kid out of Rush Henrietta, Rochester. That really wasn't my style. I was an ex-All-State football player and a basketball player, and I fell off my high horse after owning my own restaurant and being restaurant of the year in 1982 in Rochester. And I turned around and I ran into a chemical called Freebase. And to be quite honest with you, sir, I used Freebase a second time because I liked the idea of being high. Nobody told me that I was going to become a junkie and addict. Nobody told me, you know, if you use this stuff more than once, you're probably going to get hooked on it, and then you're going to get sick. And then I got to the point where I used to sniff drugs before I brushed my teeth. So at 26 years old, I ended up in the penitentiary. And then I turned around, I went to five parole boards, and they kept saying, we're going to give you two more years because of the nature of your crime. Then after 1996 to 1999, I kind of wiggled my way around college trying to find where I was or where I am. And I ran into people like Deacon Jack Burke. I was always a member of the Cephas people, so I already knew Bob Marks, and I already knew Mike Oberst, and Tony LaMarcus, and you know, and then I, then in 1999, somebody said, you know, what you need to do is you need to go see these Kairos people, because <laughs> there's some good people that will always be there for you, and I said, you got to be kidding me, and they said, there's one other catch, they got a lot of food. <laughs> so I like to eat so I said well if nothing else I'm going to show up with that old prisoner mentality and I'm going to use so I walked in the door with the idea that I wasn't going to give anything I was going to take and I took I took a whole lot Ted Jumper, I saw him the other day when I went down there to speak at the people at college and he's still playing his guitar. And I was like, Ted, you still doing this? And he said, Freddie, you had hair when I first met you too. <laughs> <laughs> Been through three back surgeries with Bob Marks. Goes out to his house in Hamburg. I do a little bit of work out in his, out in his yard for him and help him out. And he's finally gotten rid of the back brace and I'm feeling real good about that. Deacon Jack Burke had he had dark hair when we first met. <laughs> I saw him. We both cracked a little tear. I went out there to the holy hour that they had out in Collins. But let me tell you what happened in 1999. See, I walked into the place on a Thursday night, and I was kind of nervous, but I had this idea that I was going to take. I was going to take. And then they turned around, and they let me take. They put these big platters of cookies on the table, and they said, take. So I got two hands. So I have a cookie in this hand and a brownie in this one. 
and a cup of coffee and some milk and juice. <laughs> so I was doing my thing, and I was taking it, and all of a sudden, the men started talking to me. The men started letting me know that they loved me. The men started sharing with me some stuff. They started telling me about they have children. They started telling me that they have wives. They started telling me that they live in communities. They started telling me about their taxes. They started telling me about what a jerk I was, but they never called me the idiot that I am. They never said, you're a bad person. They gave me countless and countless and countless examples of how evil I was. I said to myself, you know, when you break into somebody's home, you don't mean to cause the type of destruction that you cause. What you mean to do is you mean to slip into someone's home, take their television, and go and sell it. I didn't mean for you to change your security system. I didn't mean for the cops to be on your street. I didn't mean for you to ask for brighter house lights. I didn't mean for you to turn around and tell your children to look out for people like me. I didn't mean to cause the tears. I didn't mean for insurances to go up. I didn't mean to cause any of that pain. I meant to take your television and sell it because I was sick, not to cause all the tears. Not for you to tell your children to lock the back door for the first time. I didn't mean to do that. And then I started listening to witnesses and I started listening to people from the street. People that should hate my guts sharing with me. I started listening to people telling me about their stories, about their miseries, about their pain, and I started to say, who the heck am I? Here it is, I've caused so much destruction and so much pain on society, and I've got a group of people that are coming in here and they're hugging me. Sure, I took a shower, I didn't smell that bad. But I was still trying to figure out why you're hugging me. Why are you shaking my hand? Why are you asking me my name? I had a number, 87C0098. My last name is Poole, and they called me Poole. Staff called me Poole. Other convicts called me Poole, and no one cared that my name is Frederick. No one. Lost friends, family. I turned around by the time that I had met the people at Kairos, I had lost all four grandparents. I had lost all my favorite uncles. My children are getting old, and they're getting to the point where they can start to speak out for themselves, and they're telling them, my mother and father, their grandparents, that they no longer want to come up to the prison and sit in hard chairs and benches in a visiting room where everybody is talking too loud. And I was alone. So what ended up happening after I did all that taking, after I ate all the cookies, I went back to my dorm where I was sick. I was not only spiritually sick, and empty, but I was sick because I ate too much. <laughs> so I sat there in my little stall, they call it the bathroom, and I said, God, help me. But like I told you before, I was a tough egg to crack, so I didn't really believe you yet. And then I turned around, I got up early in the morning on Friday, got dressed, got pressed, and everything like that, and I showed up and the same people were there again with a bigger smile on their face than what they had Thursday night. And I said, these people are either crazy, insane, or they want something. Isn't that crazy to think like that? Here it is, somebody giving me something, and I'm doubting you. I'm questioning you. I'm wondering what's your agenda. I know you're about to start to pass the plate around any minute. <laughs> but since I only make 12 cents an hour, you ain't going to get a whole lot. <laughs> I said, can't be my money. What do you want? Well, maybe they're going to ask me to help carry a few benches or do something. And all of a sudden, I turned around and looked at these guys, and some of the gentlemen were older than me, and they were carrying the benches and moving the chairs and doing the tables and all that kind of stuff. And they were even instructing the other inmates that were working at the place to keep the cookies coming. <laughs> and then I turned around. And I started to listen. We, we drew some 
some pictures on some big sheets of paper. Then we turned around and we went out back and they had this old big old barrel and it was full, full of fire and all that kind of stuff. And they said, write all of your sins down. And I said, well, I, I need some more paper. <laughs> they said, write everything down that you want to be forgiven for. And I just started writing and started writing and started writing. And some of the stuff got smeared because a couple of tears fell in the middle of the paper. And I kind of wiped that off. And I kept writing and writing and writing. And I stood there over that barrel of fire and I dropped it in there. And that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough here. Because I came back inside and they had this little separate chapel mm -hmm. area. And I walked in there and a couple of the guys when they're civilians were telling their stories again. And I said, why in the world, sir, would you be sharing with me your pains when you shouldn't even like a guy like me? Why should you even be talking to me? And so that lack of trust was still there. Now, I left Friday night. I wasn't as sick because I didn't eat as many cookies. I put two of them back. <laughs> you should have seen like Thursday night. <laughs> And so I said, um, so I got back Friday night, the guy said to me, they said, are you going back? And I said, sure, I'm going back. I got, I got to go back Saturday just to check on these. I said, because a couple of old guys that showed up Thursday and Friday night, I'm going to see if they're really going to show up on Saturday because I don't really believe you yet. So I showed back up on Saturday morning dressed and double pressed. And I didn't think they were tired. I thought, that, I thought that they were rejuvenated. I thought that they were grandiose. I thought that they were huge. I thought they were bigger than me. I thought that they had grown a couple of inches. And they had a little pep in their step. And I was like, how in the world you got a pep in your step? And my feet hurt and I've been sitting for two days. <laughs> and then they turned around and they, they shared some other stuff with us and then they turned around and they gave us these big old bags of agape and I sat there like a small child and I opened up letters and I looked at papers and stuff and I said, how in the world do these children know my name? I said, I'm going to figure that out part out later because I don't trust you. But the egg's been cracked. Understand that the egg's been cracked. It ain't broke yet. There ain't no yolk or nothing running out yet, but it's been cracked. And then I turned around and we had some, some nice dinner. I think they had some lasagna and bread and all this stuff, and I tried to eat up everything, right? And then after we got done with all that, we talked a little bit more, we sung a little bit more, and the one thing that was now starting to grow on me was how much love was being given to me and how open and easy this ministry was to accept. It wasn't like church. I ain't like church. You know, church, where I grew up from, I'm originally out of Delaware, you had to put up one finger and you had to tiptoe out the place when you had to go to the bathroom. You had, you had Bible study down in the basement. You had to sit up all straight and stuff like that. These people didn't even care if I leaned a little bit, if I slunched over a little bit, if I threw an elbow on the table. No one questioned that. The only thing they kept doing was they kept giving me example after example after example through my reflections of how I can look at myself and see how dumb I was. And I felt about this big. And feeling about that big was about the time that one of the civilians, they walked up to me and they said, put your coat on and come with me. I was like, oh, Lord, the last time that they told me put my coat on and walk with me, I went to the box. <laughs> but I put my coat on. Remember now, I got locked up in 1985. This is 1999. You do the math. I got 14 years, and I think that I'm tough. 
I mean, I was at Attica for five years. I watched three people get murdered. I went over to Auburn. I was sitting in Auburn for four years. I watched six homicides. I watched a dude get killed right at the basketball court, get stabbed right in the middle of the chest. I'm a tough egg to crack, but I've been cracked. Remember, the yoke ain't coming out yet. Follow the story. <laughs> I put my jacket on. I'm tough. <laughs> I had one of those big old outdoor parkers. I threw my collar up. I'm walking with my head down because I don't know what's coming next, but I know <clears throat> okay, I ain't got no contraband on me. Everything's cool, okay. Because I know that I'm about to step outside and be served. I already know this because I've been through it a hundred times before. And so I'm turning around, I'm walking with 14 years in, and the guy here to my to my right, he's got like 23 years in. And the guy here to my left, he got about 26 or 27 years in. But we all hang out. We call ourselves old timers. And we all walking out with our heads down like this here. And then all of a sudden, I hear a guitar. And I stop. And it was kind of rainy outside. And like it was like slushy outside. And it was like an overcasted evening. And I turned around and I picked my head up. And as far to my left that I could see and as far to my right that I could see, I saw little babies. I saw dogs. I saw middle-aged people. I saw older people. I saw people with guitars and banjos. And I seen people with umbrellas and people with hats on. And I'm saying, these people have come from Canada, Virginia. I see the tags. These people have come from Pennsylvania. These people have come and they've stood across the fence and the only reason why they didn't hug me and shake my hand was because of that fence. So I'm standing there. I'm, you know, I'm an old tough guy. <laughs> I'm kind of wiping my, my eyes a little bit, but I, what I did was I looked up at the sky a little bit and let a little bit of that mist and stuff hit my face a little bit so nobody knew that I was crying. And I said, oh, yeah, man, you know, that's all right then. What, what you think, bro? <laughs> and he was too busy crying 20 some years in. And he was too busy crying with almost 30 years in to answer me. And I said, look at what God has done. Now a little bit of the yoke is starting to run out. <laughs> See, now I don't forgot that I'm tough. I forgot that I was all state in football and I used to hurt people. I forgot. And I walked back inside, and that's exactly what the first civilian said to me. Please say that out loud. Amen. Thank you. That's what they said to me. And I came back on Saturday night feeling like I could conquer the world. And then I said, didn't one of those civilians tell me that they'd be back? And this is where normally that lack of trust starts to set in a little bit. And for the first time in my adult life, I started to believe you. And then I left. And then Sunday they told me, come on down to the, to the visiting room area where they got the graduation thing. And I walked in there and I thought I was playing a game again. I thought I was at Madison Square Gardens. I thought I was there for the state championship. They had people on both sides and they had people applauding and people standing up and all this kind of stuff. And you gave me, you know, my picture and you gave me the certificate of completion and all this kind of good stuff. And I said, this is absolutely wonderful. Number one, you fed me. <laughs> Number two, you turned around and you showed me some real love. Number three, you gave me an administ you showed me through a ministry of acceptance and one that I can understand. You talk to me without all of these biblical terms and without quoting scriptures to me every other second and you talk to me like I was a human being and you gave me more love than most of my friends and family don't do right today. And then you turned around and you kept your word and the following Friday you showed back up again. Now that blew my mind. That truly blew my mind, because now I step in there Friday, I'm expecting to see like two, three of you guys. I turn around and see a whole bunch of women and stuff, because they ain't let no women in college, except to deliver the food. They t I turned around and looked like 15 women came walking in, husbands came walking in, and all this kind of stuff, and all of a sudden, 
I met Deacon Jack Burke's uh, 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 son-in-law. I met, uh, you know, I met his daughter. I met, and I was like, wow. So I kept on coming. That was Kairos 37. Then I turned around, I hung around so much that it like you got to be like Kairos 44. And Deacon Jack Burke caught me on the walkway one day. He said, you know, you've been hanging around long enough, dear old timer. It's about time you come back and give something. I said, I said what do you mean? He said, you got to come back and work now. <laughs> so I came back and I worked 44 and I worked 45. But here's why the Yokers ran all the way out. Because I know you've been following me because you've been watching me. I've seen you with both eyes. <laughs> six parole boards. When I walked in on my six parole board, I walked in at Gowanda. Now, remember, I had just got complete right hip surgery. I was about <laughs> three or four months into walking again. I wasn't real stable. So I kind of limped into the room. And when I walked in there on the sixth time, the parole commissioners called me sir. They called me mister. They said, please have a seat. Them three words ain't never been said before. Mr. Sir, and please. It's usually, hey, you, state your name and number and sit down right there. Oh, here we go again. This time they said, please, sir, have a seat. And they asked me some specifics. And they asked me about peace prints. And they asked me about Kairos. Specifically, Ms. Gonzalez asked me. Mr. Smith and Mr. Brown asked me that specifically. And specifically, I looked into the camera for the first time and I said, you have saved my life. You have given me a joy and taken away my violent nature and I don't know where it went. I've been trying to find it. I was looking all underneath my bed, but I couldn't find nothing but a lint there. And they said, what do you mean by that? I said, listen here, let me explain something to you. In 1999, the Kairos people came in to see me, and they changed my life. And if you ever let me go, I guarantee you that I'm going to go back and see them and tell them thank you. Thank you. I have come here to let you know that the egg is completely broken, that the yolk is run all the way out on the ground, it's <laughs> dried up, cracked, everything like that, you know, turned it over, some people call it compost. <laughs> and I promised I was gonna come back here as a witness to the work that you do. I promised that I was gonna come back and prove to you that your work is not in vain. That it works. I did 27 years for murder in the second degree. And I have not physically thrown a punch or touched any other human being in a negative way in over 25 years. But you, what you really did for me, sir, is you brought me out of darkness and you let me understand why. I was stuck from 96 to 99, and when you showed up at Kairos at 99, you gave me some light. You gave me some understanding. You gave me some purpose. I have my college degree, and I am one who is read, and I love books, and through books, you must give me valid information for me to hang on to. I am like that. I believe in God, but give me some proof, and you proved it. You showed up and you gave me a ministry that is beyond comprehension. And then you continued to come back and support a wretch like me. And now I must keep my promise. And each and every time that I am invited, each and every time that I have the opportunity to share, each and every time that I have the opportunity to tell somebody what I do, what I believe in, and what you people do through the work of God, I tell them. I go over to Peace Prince every Wednesday, and I volunteer cook. I've cooked as a chef for over 30 years. I love it. I go over every Wednesday. I cook underneath Mike Oberst and Kathleen, Carol, and all them. I go over there and I cook. At 3 o'clock to 5.30, we have our meal, and we have our meeting at 6.30. That's what I do each and every Wednesday. But what I really, really do 
is I really love the opportunity to tell you thank you. Thank you. You don't know sometimes because fools like me usually get out of prison and turn our backs on you and try to start and reestablish a life and we move on. We don't come back very often. We don't do that enough. But I know one thing for sure. Laying in the house sometimes, doing some work in time, and all of a sudden my little phone goes beep, and I pick it up, and all of a sudden it's an email from Dorothy at Collins Cairo saying, I hope you have a wonderful day. And I said, wow. My own sister don't do that. My own blood sister don't do that. So let me remind you one last time, and then I'm going to shut up, why I'm really here. I'm really here to tell you, thank you for cracking the egg. Thank you for letting the yolk, which is the residue and the dirt and the filth and the grime and the missed thoughts and the misunderstandings, thank you for letting all that run all the way out and dry all the way out. We are having such a wonderful conversation when we are riding down here. I want to thank you for that trip. Senses in common. So I don't know where a man came with this idea of common sense because a lot of things that people should know, they don't know. A lot of men and women sit up in the prison system and there's a lot of things that you think that they should know, they don't. They don't understand peace. They don't understand love. They don't understand a working family relationship. A lot of them don't understand the importance of following the law, the rules, the regulations. One thing that Kairos has shown me is that the better that I get towards following the law, the better that I get towards following the rules and regulations, the freer I am. Amen. You see, if this young man that brought me all the way down here hadn't followed the law, we'd be... Stuck on the side of the road with one of them <laughs> lights going off, and that man would have been handing him out a ticket. He'd have been a couple hundred dollars broker, and I'd have been sitting there going, Oh my God, I'm a felon. I'm on parole. There's police contact. I'm free. No, I don't work. I don't go out every day and punch a clock. I got an 80 year old mother in law who has Alzheimer's, and I stay home with her each and every day. I don't want my family to have to pay $400 a week anymore to watch her. I'm captive in my own home a lot of times because I have to lock screen doors to make sure she doesn't sneak out when I go use the bathroom and go take a shower. I make sure she gets her meds every day. I make sure she eats. I make sure she takes her bath. I make sure that she's straight. And I always put it on her favorite cowboy show. She loves gun smoke. <laughs> My day starts at 6 o'clock in the morning and usually ends around 8 or 9 o'clock each and every day. That's between housework, that's between taking care of her, and that's between looking out for my wife. But what I really want to say is that Kairos is what gave me the strength to do that. You don't know how good you are. But don't I look good? <laughs> and I help you. Didn't you help me through it? Wasn't it because of the work that you have done to save a person like me? Because one thing about it, after 27 years, you don't want no jerks coming back to your society. You don't want no fools coming back to your streets. And let me give you some real hardcore facts. 94% of all incarcerated men and women in New York State return to the street. Make sure they come back right. A person who has either changed spiritually or changed academically drops from 70% down to 15% recidivism rate. Watch your taxes. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to take care of a healthy young inmate. I was up around $55,000 to $60,000. To get my hip replaced, I was on four different pain medications. I'm getting spinal and hip epidurals, probably about every three or four months. I blew my hip out in 1996, 97, and I walked with a limp for almost six, seven years. 
but because of Congress. I'm not going to ever, because it's gone from my heart, commit another crime. I'm okay to be around your grandkids. I'm not a sex offender. I'm okay to walk into your grocery stores in the same neighborhood that you go into. I'm trying to rally all the people on my street right now to put in three, four dollars a piece so we get some dandelion killer. That's where my heart is. Because I don't like looking at them things. I think they're nice, pretty long. You don't have it. <laughs> what I'm truly saying is, is that I am a witness of your success. It's not about me. I didn't come here to tell you anything really about me. The only reason why I even took you through a little bit of that past stuff is just so you would understand what I've been through. Keep up the good work. I heard somebody say that we welcome younger people because I'm getting too old for this. I heard somebody say that earlier. <laughs> That's true. I'm not saying anybody in the room is too old to get the job done. All I'm saying is if you got some sons, if you got some grandsons, if you got some friends, if you got some family, let them know that people like me are definitely coming back home. So you got a choice to make. Join Kairos and get on a good foot and help save these fools because they're coming back anyway. <laughs> or turn the blind eye until some nonsense comes into your front door, into your own lap, and then you got to check it, and then you got to see, you know, sure. what's really going on. Hey. Okay? But Kairos is absolutely wonderful. Those three days of ministry changed my life. Mainly because of the follow-up. So, in full retrospect, and in, in its great entirety, in its circle, I had to come back, and I will always come back, to say thank you.